today we will be looking at the energy trilemma. I introduced you to this concept in the first class and today we are going to look in depth um, at it and why is it important. We'll have a few exercises um, to do and I'd like you to think from not just a global context but we'll drill down to the local context and see does the energy trilemma apply to you? How do you use this as a framework to analyze what types of decisions you can make? Does it apply outside of the public sector? Because it's usually very easy to blame the government for everything. But then beyond the government, what levels of responsibility exist? And if you had the power, what would you do? But even more importantly, what can you do now? So today we'll have quite a bit of material to look through. So the introduction is over. We'll review the energy trilemma for those who may not have understood the concept the first time. I, I introduced it. We will then look at the energy trilemma and the sustainable development goals. How do they sort of apply? Why, do I, why am I talking about the energy trilemma in the context of the energy transition? Because this course is about the energy transition. We'll then look at, we're talking about a global energy trilemma, but what are the local nuances? And this is where your participation will be required from your local context. Does the energy trilemma apply at all and in what ways? And finally, we'll conclude, give you a short break, and then get back and look at other things which hopefully will keep us engaged. So this was a slide in the first class. So the energy trilemma is about three competing interests in energy systems that seem to have an equal force. Which means that in order to have a sustainable energy system, these three elements must balance. Which is the question of politics or security of energy supply, um, economics or affordability, and environmental climate change or sustainability. But one element that I'd like to introduce, and I'd like you to constantly keep this in mind, is what I now call the energy quadrilemma. I did not coin this term, but I was there when a few of the scholars, you know, were debating this at two in the morning after having a few Scottish whiskies. Um, and the main question is, thank you. The main question is people. Because people make these decisions, people drive the decisions. When you talk about politics, politicians think of votes. When you think of policies, policies are designed by people. Even when you look at companies, companies in law are recognized as, pe as persons, as legal persons with capacity. But it's the people behind the companies that make the decisions. And so there's no way we, you can balance the energy trilemma without having a focus on humans. And if you look at um, climate change, some people call it anthropogenic climate change. So anthropos in Greek means human-centered. So we cannot avoid this. And when we talk about the energy trilemma, the framework for the energy transition here is a question of justice. How do we justly transition from a fossil fuel um, global economy to a low carbon economy? It, it, does anybody have any question on the concept? Because the rest of the class will be modeled on this concept. Anyone who hasn't understood anything on this slide please ask now, because the ensuing disc discussions will be based on the concept. Um, I shall take silence and a slight nod of the head to mean you're fine. So we'll now start looking at each of these elements. And then in subsequent slides, you'll start seeing how these things bleed into each other, that politics can actually be influenced by economics, and that people can be behind politics, and that the environmental issues can actually move um, both politics and economics. Now let's just very quickly look at this and I'm looking at this from a standpoint of law. So remember we spoke about the energy cycle in the first class and from how energy is extracted or harnessed to how it's used and the waste material is disposed of. So same thing in politics we have energy security or security of supply issues. We 
have a few Russian uh, students, Russian students in class, and so right now the war in Ukraine is in vogue. And the war in Ukraine, um, Russia supplies gas for most of Western Europe. Um, with uh, the war in Ukraine and say places like Germany and the EU trying to transition away from Russian gas, it means that they have to find alternatives. They do not have that much gas. So the alternatives are not exactly easy to find. One of the alternatives, and this is happening in Germany and I think it's Hamburg, they've built an offshore regasification um, plant where large ships take what is called shale gas and um, liquefy it and transport it and then they take it to a port and then they regasify it. So they turn it from gas to liquid to transport it and then they turn it back to gas. Germany wants to build sort of an offshore regasification uh, unit, not wants to, they actually I think uh, are almost about to get online and then with pipelines into Germany. Of course the cost of that and the practicalities of that are insane because if you look at shale gas, unlike um, gas in general, um, the prices change because the time, the price when the gas was extracted and gasified, let's say it was the US, and the time that it gets to a depot, um, the price changes. Gas prices, gas pricing has quite a few equations. I, maybe next time I should come and write like Adam. You know, just how these contracts factor these mathematical um, algorithms to determine what the gas price is. Usually it was based on oil, on the oil price and two or three standards like the Brent price. But now with different sources of gas, uh, the price is really difficult to determine. But because Germany does not want to be dependent on Russia, they will go to this expense. But that's just one example of security of energy supply. Look at places like Australia or South Africa. South Africa in COP26 pledged to transition from coal to clean or green sources of energy. And there's something called the Just Transition Partnership, where the EU and the US the UK and a couple of other countries gave South Africa a several billion dollars to do so. But then even with those several billion dollars, South Africa has, is now just starting to come up with a plan of how to transition because of various factors and politics is one of them. Number one, their energy minister used to be part of the labor movement. And most of South African labor movement is based around mining. And coal is one of the largest mining enterprises in South Africa. So wearing his labor hat on, um, he wants to protect jobs. So even with this money to transition, he's thinking, how, how am I going to stack up against the labor union movement, which is exceptionally strong in South Africa, and how are we going to preserve those jobs? So politics plays a key role and security of energy supply. No country wants to be dependent on another and they will try and use the resources that they have even if those resources are not good for the environment. Or sometimes people will take expensive energy over cheap energy because of energy security. So what is the policy design? What does the policy mean? Does the policy take into account the energy trilemma? Or does the policy take into account one factor over the other? And these are difficult questions because when we talk about many developing countries or least developed countries, it's not like they have the economic power to determine whether they can take a more expensive option or not. So economics in that case will be the overriding interest. So these are the things that I want you to start thinking about because you're going to do certain exercises. If you're given a certain country, What's their GDP looking like? What are their main problems? Um, what kind of population do they have? And the other question is, do they have law and policy that would steer them to, toward the environment? Is there a climate change law? Is the right to a clean environment enshrined in their laws? Do their courts, are their courts progressive and do they interpret them that way? So I'd like you to start thinking about these things when, you, when you're analyzing questions of 
um, climate change and transitioning because these are the complexities that face policymakers when they're making those decisions. Of course, economics is how much money goes to various energy resources. And this is now not just about government. And you will see very soon in this class and in the next one just how non-state actors or private actors or companies can actually determine policy and can determine how an energy mix of a country looks like. And there are certain things I'd like you to you know, sort of start to internalize. And one of them is when you set up an energy project or energy infrastructure, how long does that last? So if someone sets up a coal plant today, what is its life cycle? What's the end of life? And this is a really important question because if you look at most energy infrastructure, the shortest period usually is about 20, 25 years, usually 40 years renewable. So you're locking in a country to between 60 and 80 years of this specific type of energy source. So if you see a new coal plant, you know that coal is going to be part of your energy mix for at least 40 years. What does that mean for the environment? So these are the things you know, that you, you need to start begin to begin to analyze. So how much goes for each of the stages in the energy cycle? Why is this important? I'll give you an example of oil and gas. So the, co the companies that um, exp uh, explore, so this is how it starts. There's a rumor that in Karnataka, there's a huge oil deposit. So the government here, the central government and the Karnataka government, do not have the money to do so. So they issue licenses. So they here around uh, where Nandi Hills, there's oil. So they issue um, licenses for people to come and prospect for oil and gas. People here means corporations. You would expect that Shell, ExxonMobil, the large companies or the super majors would do so. They don't. It's smaller players like, um, they're smaller but not particularly small, but smaller players like Talo Oil who will come and explore. So they'll get the licenses. And depending on how corrupt your, your country is, a politician will get the license and then lease it out to one of these ones. Once the exploration is done and they strike oil, there's the development phase. The tallow oils do not have the power to do the, the exploitation of the resource. So once they find it, the money that they have is to do just that. So then they sell on to the Shells, the Exxon Mobiles, the other larger companies to do the development. They do the development, they sell the oil, and then when it comes toward the end of life, these bigger companies know that they'll have a decommissioning um, obligation. They'll be required to clean the environment, they'll be required to remove, they'll be required maybe to take care of the communities. So what do they do? When they know the reserves are about to be finished, they sell to a smaller company. When the oil runs out on the smaller company, the smaller company declares bankruptcy because they don't have the money to do the decommissioning. So the communities and the countries then bear the burden of doing that. Is that fair? Of course the answer is no. So this is important. How much goes into each of the stages of the energy cycle? If you look at um, the nuclear industry, the nuclear industry requires the industry itself to have guarantees of, for safety, safeguards, and cleanup up front. They have to take insurance, huge insurance, I mean at least a billion dollars. So should this happen for other energy sources? Because people view nuclear as the most dangerous. But you can see that these other sources of energy have left communities deprived for decades and even centuries now. So should the same standards be applied across e each energy source? These are the questions you need to think about. When we talk about externalities, Many economists think in monetary, in financial terms. Um, if you talk to an economist, words like efficiency would come up. But externalities are what are the non-monetary 
impacts or costs that are there. What are the mortality and mobility rates? How sick do people get in these mines? Um, what are the accidents around energy infrastructure? Um, what is the environmental cost? Um, what's, what are the impacts of climate change? These are externalities that are usually not considered in the modeling, in the economic models of um, setting up energy infrastructure and setting up energy systems. But increasingly, we are seeing these are being infused in what is called ESG. But ESG, which is, anyone in class who knows what ESG is? I've been talking too much. Yes, please. within your company are you when you talk about society or sustainability um, do you have any environmental policies and so it started off almost it, as a voluntary thing that companies said oh we are ESG compliant we have these policies but now they're starting to slowly crystallize into legal obligations and you, you have a question oh okay no, I had a, a huge. <laughs> so, um, yes, please. Ah, so it started off as a part of CSR. CSR, for those who do not know, means corporate social responsibility, which was um, corporate here being companies, companies choosing to give back to communities. Um, say, I've talked about oil and gas infrastructure. So you set up uh, an oil and gas um, facility. You then build a school, a hospital, and roads for the community around to provide services. That was considered CSR. And it made companies look good for marketing purposes. But secondly, and more importantly, who can guess why people or companies um, engaged in CSR? Tax breaks. So all these projects were tax deductible. And so it wasn't pure um, altruism or they were just doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. There was also an economic benefit. But there's also something called societal buy-in. Because in many countries, especially where the governments do not have the resources or the countries are poor or poorly managed, communities would be happy to accept, you know, a road, a school and a hospital, even if the comparative um, advantage to how much resources are being removed from their communities are not, uh, are not comparable at all. So it's 
to get societal buy-in, to get um, tax breaks, and for PR. However, it's now moving away from CSR to obligations. So especially larger companies, especially multinationals, are having their shareholders say, look, we are not going to invest money in companies that are not sustainable or responsible. So remember what I said, there was a distinction between hard law in treaties and soft law, which are principles that then may not have, um, may not be binding, but they're still complied with. So it's the same thing ap applies to this. It started off as voluntary. It still is largely voluntary, but companies that do not participate in this are considered um, unsustainable and therefore they lose money. So always remember when we talk about the energy transition, the, f the framework, the f reference frame is the Sustainable Development Goals. And the Sustainable Development Goals are important because when you talk about sustainability, this is essentially what it's been distilled down to. And the same as the energy trilemma, you'll notice that these things are interlinked. Because without good health, um, you cannot have you know, economic growth. You cannot reduce inequality. Without, with hunger, you cannot have good health. With, without renewable energy, you cannot have sustainable economic growth. You cannot have sustainable cities and communities and so on. So these things are interlinked. But for purposes of this class, for example, renewable energy has a high impact on climate action. And remember, as I told you, 66% of global carbon emissions are traceable to, to the energy, uh, en energy industry. So if you transform the energy industry, you will then have incredible climate action. But there is something else we are going to look at today, because we think in terms of countries only. You know, when, when you think of which are the largest polluters, uh, top five, one, raise your hand, say something so that you encourage me, you know. I saw someone, maybe I thought it was Mekdes saying something, so maybe you could just say it now. China, another one. Sorry? So US. Yes, countries, the largest polluters. India. Yeah, of course, but no, no one from India has said so. <laughs> so we also have um, the EU as, as a group there, highly emitting. Um, and if you even look at the size, sizes of the countries, like the UK emits huge amounts. Germany, incredible amounts of CO2. Places like Brazil, Australia, um, South Africa in, in Africa is the largest emitter. But Believe it or not, Africa contributes 3% of global carbon emissions. 3%. Yet the most vulnerable people are in, on that continent. So we think in terms of countries, but we'll also look at there are various ways that policy can lead to climate action without necessarily looking at countries. So always remember the SDGs. Are there any questions so far? So... What does this have to do with the energy transition? I think I've already mentioned it. Like we started from a fossil fueled uh, e economy. And if you look at it honestly, although the sort of technology seems to improve on a day to day, we are literally just burning stuff. From the discovery of fire, how we generate energy is just taking things and burning them and creating energy out of them. I think it's time we evolved from, from that, surely. You know, more than 10,000 years of using the same logic to produce energy, I think is, is ridiculous. Because if you think of coal, if you think even of nuclear, it's about high heat, steam, electricity. And we have other ways of generating energy. We have solar, we have wind, there's tidal energy. So in spite of the sort of technology, you know, our, forebearers just lit firewood or whatever thing they could find. Now we are lighting oil and gas. So we are literally just burning things, which is one of the reasons that causes emissions. 
But apart from the emissions of burning the things, generating the energy is also about high heat. And when you think of manufacturing as well, it's literally about extremely high heat converting things from one form to the other. So we need to transition from that to this. Now let's move away from this global stuff and start looking at local. So, if you think of the communities you're from, whether it's Siberia or Tamil Nadu, who has access to money? Yes, please. Yes. Yep. Tamils mainly, but I'm seeing all like the politics, the economy, and like, are we not supposed to focus only on one point and then the others? Like, what's the main challenge? The main challenge of the energy trilemma is the trilemma itself. No, I mean, this sounds, this sounds like a circular answer, but it, it is not. And this is a very good question because what is the greatest challenge to your society? Because that then determines the kind of policy action that's taken. Let's take an example of um, Beijing. Uh, China is not known to have these climate friendly policies. But people who are not breathing in cities, their days, you know, the um, pollution levels are so high, people are asked, do not drive into the city, do not come into this city with your cars. So at that stage, what is driving, um, what is the main policy driver? It's the environment. But this, even if it means there'll be a huge economic cost to it. And this is the one thing that we need to ask ourselves. Are we in a state of such climate and environmental crises that will say, look, it will cost us some money now, but we had better do it. Alternatively, what drives the politics is what will determine that. Are the citizens of Beijing saying, look, we need to breathe in our own city, and you need to do something to allow us to continue living here? Then the policy will be more environmental, rather than how much does it cost the city to do this. So the energy trilemma is complex in that way. And this is one, of, one question I want you to think about in some of the exercises that you're going to do, which is, if you are the one with that authority, and if you're thinking of, say, Addis, or you're thinking of um, the Volta region in Ghana, or you're thinking of Siberia, or you're thinking of Delhi, what would you prioritize, and how would you go about it? What policies can you actually put in place? What is the bigger crisis? And we'll watch something that I... It's one of my all-time favorites, and I've, oh, I, I never knew I'd come to teach in India, but now that I'm here, it's one thing that we'll watch, and I'd like to hear an Indian's perspective. Because the first time I played it, the Indian students in the class were not happy. Um, but I'd like to, you to just see, and I actually went to Delhi, and I saw for myself, I could not believe, I'll, I'll, not, spoil, I'll not give you a spoiler a lot, but yeah, you'll see. So, so, Inadequate regulatory, physical infrastructure, and economic diversity are a huge problem. If you do not have law and policy steering you into that direction, most people will prioritize profit. And when I say most people here, I mean the corporations or the governments, because money talks, and we'll see how loudly it talks. So the reason law, policy, and regulation are important is they can act as a steer to prevent what economists call some form of market failure or unintended consequences. Cultural. Now, this was an interesting one. I think I mentioned this in the first class. In Namibia and South Africa, solar was considered to be for poor people because the government pro project that rolled out solar power to heat their water during winter, they got cheap um, Chinese solar panels that did not work. And so the people in the townships um, who were given this, when the government wanted to actually roll out rooftop solar for other purposes, they said no. Even when they were being paid to take the solar panels, they said no, not at all. We want the same electricity as everybody else. And if any of you, please take your time and Google ESCOM. Even right now, they're having blackouts because the national ESCOM is their utility company. They simply cannot provide 
um, electricity for their masses using the national grid. Even today, if you Google, like it's a, a, a long-standing problem. And one of the best ways of, doing, of dealing with this is decentralizing energy. So they considered it for poor people. In Namibia, they didn't consider it really for poor people, but they said, look, I want to iron my shirt when I go to church. And this thing can only power my mobile phone and a radio and a light bulb. I want to have a pressed shirt just as much as, some, as, as a rich person. But is this a function of solar power or is it a policy failure? Had they confirmed or gotten the right solar panels, there would have been a greater buy-in of the communities. Had they, in Namibia, had they sort of given the communities the right information and expectations, they would not try to iron their shirts with one solar panel that can simply power things. So sometimes community engagement is really useful. Now, you cannot throw money at every problem. So money alone will not solve this. I just urge you to look at the Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves. So in 1.3 billion people, and that number keeps fluctuating, do not have access to electricity in the world. Most of them are in developing Asia and Africa. So most of us in this room are from developing Asia and Africa. Every year, every year, at least 100, not even 100,000 people, that could be, in, let's say 100,000 people, if the WHO statistics are, are at least correct, die from indoor air pollution. Most people in developing countries that have access to electricity still cook with firewood or stoves. Um, and I'm not sure how it works here, like in rural areas, people still use firewood. So the Global Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves is to try and ensure that people have access to clean cooking facilities. As of 2020, they had spent a billion dollars, a billion dollars to ensure that there is clean cook stoves. I looked at the African statistics. Kenya was doing the best in Africa. Yet, less than 10% of the population had access to clean cooking facilities. In Uganda, where they spent a lot of money as of 2021, only 1% had access to clean cooking facilities. So the reason law, policy, and regulation are important is even with money, you can get the wrong outcome if your initiatives are not correct. And this is why I talk about the energy quadrilemma. Why do you think, even with money, these solutions did not work? Anyone who can guess? Corruption is something that has been said. Anyone else? Impl what do you mean by implementation? You, know, you, have, you have a good idea, but what, do you, what does that mean? Correct. So there are cultural reasons. Some people weren't ready to make the switch. But let me give you, someone wants to raise their hand. Yes, please, Pavel. Okay. This problem, uh, I know that people in Russia will face. I mean, there are not people. Uh, so if uh, citizens are not informed uh, correctly, uh, then the, any reformation, any implementation uh, is to uh, be failed. So information. Uh, Okay, information is very important. Anybody else? I think the people. Okay. Uh, if the people are not willing to go in for the clean food stuff, thing, then the idea of spending money on it becomes a waste because the people don't have access to it. And maybe some of them are not even willing to uh, go for that. Yeah. I think there is economic aspect in the world. Yes. For example, like at my home, uh, we use mostly firewood, though we have um, gas and uh, cooking stands. Because they think that like, for our gas cylinder, 
it goes around like more than half of the place. So it's not that um, accessible for everyone in the rural area. So mostly there is this cultural aspect, this economic thing. So that's why people are letting this and go to the street in the developing countries. That's true. Like this. Um, also, I don't think that it's not a sustainable solution because uh, you're giving them the same cooking stove, but are you guaranteeing that they have a good power to even be able to do it? So, like, you're just solving one problem, but then the whole the whole problem is being solved. So. Very good points around. Anyone from this side of the class? Any thoughts? Many thoughts, but not vocalized. So all those are very good reasons, but many, many times it's not engaging the people for whom you're designing the solution for. I'll give you an example. They gave them cook stoves, and we know um, a lot of societies in developing Asia and Africa are communal societies, and what they usually cook with, like in, they, they, they have different names. The Swahili name is Mawetatu, which means three stones. So you have three stones. If you want a cup of tea for yourself, you bring the stones together, you put a small pot. If you want to cook for 20 people, you put the stones far apart and you place a lot of it. If you give someone a standard sized stone, it's no use to them when they have visitors. It's no use to them if they're cooking for the family. Or if they try and do so, they will take so much longer, it's useless. So they receive the, the thing and they're very happy and it's kept on the side. I haven't lived in England and you know sitting through quite a few conversations, whether from an academic perspective or looking at funders and NGOs and international organizations. A lot of the people designing things that are well-meaning, but they haven't engaged the people to find out why. I remember cook and cooling, there was a cooling discussion at Cambridge a few years ago. And they were asking why? Why why are we giving people fridges and they're putting shoes in them? <laughs> and, and, you know, we're giving them freezers so that, you know, it will help with their sanitation. It, and, you know, I ask a simple question. You're giving this to a demographic that earns their money on a daily basis. They will not do shopping for three months and store those things there. Two, do they have a sustainable supply of electricity? Three, on a cultural basis, how do they cook? Do people like taking something out of the freezer that's three months old? Or do they slaughter their chicken and, and, and make it immediately? So having not engaged um, people at that level, people use those things for drawers or as cupboards. And in terms of priorities, will they prioritize an energy bill? Or what will they prioritize? And you know, it's that level of that was uh, implementation was a good point, but also the sustainable part. Whenever people are given grants only, it is not a sustainable solution because it's something that has been given to them. Like a solar panel, if you're given a solar panel and if it breaks down, if it, if it came for free, you'll be like, oh, okay. And I see a lot of this in distributed solar, in especially the East Africa region. They come as grants, the community is extremely happy. When there's a breakdown, no one knows how to fix it. The father left a long time ago, and they revert back to what, you know, what they were before. So there must be some form of not just top-down intervention to have solutions that work for a long time. Technical, centralized versus decentralized power generation. If I use the same countries that are there, even in the US, you cannot have purely centralized electricity because places like Alaska are physically not within the US. In Namibia, we have, they have about 2.2 million people and it's five times the size of the UK. So it doesn't make sense to have a transmission line to terminate your village of 10, 20, 30, 40 people hundreds of kilometers away because you have transmission losses, which means they will never be able to pay for, for that. And the infrastructural cost, even for 100 years, will not make sense. But then we need to step back and ask ourselves, do you look at energy as a commodity or as an essential service? 
So energy has been commoditized for hundreds of years. But do we see this as a fundamental aspect to live modern life? And then if you see it as a mix of both, how do you create laws, policies, and regulations that reflect this? So Rwanda, for example, is making the transition from diesel to renewable energy, not for environmental reasons at all, but diesel prices are so high that actually having renewable infrastructure saves the government a lot of money. Nigeria is an interesting country. I wish there was a Nigerian in this class. So Nigeria is a large oil and gas producing country. Up to very recently, they did not have an oil refinery. They were selling crude oil and buying oil and gas and buying petroleum products and you know, uh, gas refined from abroad. So unlike the Middle East where I think at some stage, if not still, petrol is cheaper than buying water, in Nigeria, petrol is still expensive. Diesel is still expensive. And in terms of electricity, they have such high power cuts or just lack of access that almost every home has a diesel generator as a backup everywhere. The potential savings per year are $2.4 billion to the Nigerian economy. But who can guess why they're having a hard time transitioning from diesel generation to electricity generation from the government? Anyone? It was something that was mentioned previously. Why would Nigeria, if they would save $2.4 billion by year, why would they not take those cost savings and improve their electricity grid and electricity provision? They know these statistics. <coughs> so initial finances aren't there, maybe, maybe not. This is partly true, they're used to the system. It's actually the people who import generators and distribute them and sell them are extremely well politically connected. So they have no incentive whatsoever to, to, tra to, to transition. So, but at what cost to not just the country but to the people? Because with, apart from the pollution, and the expense. Few people can afford, only the middle class and others can afford backup generation consistently. So, and if you think beyond the home, just, and you'll see in one of the slides, if you have a small business, you need light. If you, you know, the informal sector, about 80% of the economy in many sub Saharan African countries consists of smallholder farmers and the informal sector, you know, traders, people who sell their little wares, tailors. What the impact, the knock-on effect of that on the economy would be incredible. Having light can extend how long a trader can work because in many tropical countries, we have almost a 12-hour day. So the earliest you can start is, say, 6.30, and by 7 o'clock, it's pitch black. If you could extend by two hours the productivity um, of, say, a market, because most people leave work to go and buy stuff, how much would that generate? And I can see the class is starting to get tired, so do not worry. Environmental. So oil and gas producing countries rely on oil and gas as a source of revenue. I think I mentioned this in the first class. So if you're telling them to transition, you're not just asking them to change their energy system. You're asking them to lose earnings because they export these things. So how will these societies move on? How can you transform them? Like in the RSS in South Sudan, the Republic of South Sudan, the Sudan and Mozambique, 
and places like Nigeria as well, or Middle Eastern countries, they are now starting to diversify. But if you tell them not to explore and exploit oil and gas, we are looking at a huge chunk of their GDP just gone. So how do they transition? How would you do it if you're in one of those countries? Geothermal. Even places where countries seem to have transitioned fairly quickly, part of it is an accident of nature. We have geothermal resources in Kenya, and we're probably world leading at about 80% renewable energy, but because the geothermal resources exist. In Ethiopia, they're building the largest dam because the Nile happens to go through Ethiopia. If it went through another country, they would not be talking about a large hydro project. So we also need to critically think that some of the countries that have transitioned, like Norway, transitioned to hydro in 1918 because they have all these river resources. So what resources exist and how can you harness them? One thing that shocks me about India every time on the trip that we went to, I saw one solar panel in a temple, in the shade. Like, there's so much sun here, there's hardly any rooftop solar you see, especially anywhere, and it's available. So, I'll give you an example in, in California and in Canada. More new building projects are required to have solar power to at least power their water heating systems. Something like that would transform many parts of India. Just something that simple. Even before you start forcing other people, if you are having a new building project, for you to get a permit, there has to be solar in here. So some policy interventions can make a, a huge difference. Now, this is the thing that I wanted us to look at. Um, <laughs> um, and <coughs> ah, someone should pay for a license, but um, Katia Baz is directed by Deepthi Kakar and Farhat Mustafa. Katia Baz is a movie that is based on the problem of electricity in India, especially Kanpur. This one. Okay. Oh, it wasn't this one, but hey, then I hope this one. Is. Line say connection cut one should be a subject love action. Come 
खरीदोनी है कहाँ पैसा नहीं आया है कहाँ कटिया लगी है सब आपको जानकारी होनी चाहिए नहीं है तो ले ली है चौबीस घंटे में कम से कम अठारह घंटे बिजली का अपना हम सोलह घंटे मांग के चल रहे हैं चालू हमारा पर हुनर है इतने भयंकर कटिया बाज है कोई इलाके में नहीं कटिया ऐसी डाल देंगे शायद इतना बड़ा आंधी आ जाए तूफान आ जाए कटिया मेरी हिल नहीं सकती है तो तो ये पूरी मार्केट जानती है उसी की मेहरबानी है ये जो ये सब काम हो रहा है लोहा का मतलब आप जानते हैं ये बहुत सॉलिड आदमी है जैसे लोहा होता है Everyone today wants to have electricity, but they all think that yes, it should be provided to us free of cost because we are poor. सबसे ये आई है ना चचा पब्लिक तो जीने ही सुवाल कर गया अब तो उसे पैसा दिखता है मोबाइल नहीं दिखता। हथियार खुली जरा मापन आड़े रहो पलक कर बन बात बात बन पंजाब बनना थोड़ा बाइट के मारो। अरे काल रही था तुम्हारा है। ये सीढ़ी काल रही है। हम्मा तुम्हारे हैं मेरे ही। अरे अमरे संतोष बिचर गए और तैयार रोड पर मतलब के ये आगे आओगे आइए व्यवस्था दिखली और एक तरफ का रावण अगर पुलिस ते करी तो सहर सहर नहीं Okay, what are your thoughts um, on on this? Sorry. Yes, this is the trailer I wanted to show. Um, for most people in in Europe, they cannot believe that you'll have someone biting, you know, a wire and connecting and connecting. <laughs> Yeah, so I, I thought it was quite funny, but it captures the questions we are talking about beautifully. So how many of you know Akatia? Oh, it's quite a few. I mean, I went to Delhi and I went to the government quarter, which looked almost like Westminster. And then I went to old Delhi and I thought, <laughs> I thought I would die. You know, the wires were, the connections, it looked like a spider's web. But if you look beyond the humor, you can see all the issues they're talking about. You only care about money, not the people. We don't even want 18 hours of electricity. Just give us 16. And apparently Katia is the most popular person there. But you see how quickly this has transitioned from economics to the right to, to electricity to a political question. They're saying the new governor is just arrogant. She must go because she's interfering with Katia. But... There are other questions because electricity is not free. So who's paying for this electricity? In many countries, they never say this, but there is a cost of lost electricity that is then distributed to the other rate payers. One country that has an, an, a line item is Turkey. Turkey in your electricity bill, they show a fuel cost they show taxes, and they show electricity theft. So the people who are actually paying for this electricity are the people who are actually paying bills that are connected to the utility company. Is that fair? Should there be differential rates depending on where one is? In Kenya, there is. In rural areas, they pay a lower rate of electricity. In slums, as there was one particular slum, the largest slum in, in Nairobi. The electricity connections were so bad, they were causing national instability of the grid. So the government literally just connected them because it is easier to manage the electricity grid than when Akatia does it. So what other issues can you pick from, uh, from, from this? How much time have we got? I think... You guys are suffering after the trip. Yeah, because um, for those who missed the trip, uh, our condolences. Yes. <laughs> we had a wonderful trip around temples and uh, Mysore. 
So anyway, back back to this. So in the next in the afternoon session, we'll get into groups and we'll look at some of these things. When we talk about protests, protests are agitating for something. Lobbying is agitating for something using access to political power, usually with a lot of money. Do you think that determines policy outcomes? Do you think it is easy to get rid of a katia in that community? Just a simple question. Is it how many people said they, they know, know a katia at some stage? Is it easy to get rid of a katia in your community? It's easy. No, yeah, not that, yes. But, uh, you know, there were, uh, I've seen there were people who did have access to electricity nearby my home and they used to do oh. this. Yeah, so they used to do So maybe, like, I'm not sure if it's possible. So, do you want to ask someone to solve for certain initiatives? So there are communities what we need, right? Not only a person or uh, because yeah, it's like many many of people of the village they don't want to get the electricity meters and all. They just want to do that thing, to uh, the wire, and they want to get that electricity because they are not being so it is going to the communities in some places. So I do think there is a uh, the government or the police should be more strict about this. Because we can govern the panchayat. So, who is contesting for the panchayat president or this kind of post will never tell them not to do so because of his political interests. But there should be certain strict uh, policies. I think. In Kamala, we have other units of legislative agreement. We can all also. It's a policy like they, the government and the election manifesto is just there to bring this. Like you will already get under the means of the legislation. Everybody uses that now. So under which is free. And one thing uh, uh, by 2016 2011, mm -hmm. the Tamil government, PMP government back then, we had a very uh, huge power shortage. So we used to have equivalent to 80 hours of power that every day. We had the, all the, the economy went down, and we have so much of issues. I still remember every day uh, for, during night, you know, one hour will have current, one hour will not have current. So we used to sleep like that. Night. We were, it was very difficult. And summers, very, very difficult. We don't have, have uh, fan. And uh, by 7 pm, 7 to 8 pm, peak economic activity happens you know, at night. Mm -hmm. All the people go for shopping. We used to have power cut at 7 to 8 pm. By, by then. So we children used to come out and play hide and seek during that time. Uh, I still remember that. So that was the power situation uh, back then and that government lost and for 10 years they couldn't come back to power. Okay, that's, that's a really interesting point. They lost and so it became an election, an election issue to the point that they lost and never came back to power in 10 years. Um, which, where is this? Tamil Nadu. Okay. Vithika. It obviously is very difficult to want to do away with his uh, beliefs, Kadiyas, 
uh, it is a large population is mostly dependent on them. Uh, and when we talk about communities uh, driving this entire activity, so the government was to you know remove these khatiyas altogether. Then would they take responsibility of distributing the same amount of energy to these communities? So I think it becomes it, it, it kind of comes as an incentive for the government to kind of act them in case because otherwise they would be responsible for doing uh, you know that the entire amount of activity for these communities. So I think off record they just are comfortable letting them be. Okay. Um, yeah. Uh, well, talking of uh, Ghana, for example, uh, it's it's came to a point where we have uh, load shedding. We had a ten people for lighting. So sometimes the community will have a light, another community, will have a light. and uh, that was the previous government. And this government tried to stabilize things, uh, but still there were some issues. But recently, there was something they did, which was uh, cleaning up the electricity mess. So they went to all communities, not all, let me say most communities, then they will go to your home, go to the community, check the meters. If someone is legally connected, then they'll disconnect the person, then they'll make you pay for the number of years or the number of months that you've been using the electricity without paying. And that uh, gave a little cleanup to the electricity system before I came to India. But there is also an issue of politics. For example, where we are staying now back in my home, we've been here there for three years. We've gone to the DC, we've gone to the MP, we've gone to the electricity, the regional place, but still we are not connected to the electricity. So we are using solar. So it, for me, this one, I, I sometimes I think uh, I think that so if the government wants people to be connected, the government gets incentive, but you go to them, they are not connecting you, so what are they really doing? Right? Yeah, but one impressive impressive thing that I liked was the cleaning of the electricity mess where they went to every home, disconnected people who were not connected and people who were overusing the electricity uh, and paying making them pay the incentive that they were not being. Yes. Yeah, I think it also becomes hard for the government to manage because, at least to speak uh, of Addis, there are illegal settlements that are happening in the city very rapidly, mm -hmm. which are not registered in the system. So, when government provides facilities like electricity, water, and all these things, this comes with like registered system and official settlement, right? So, when this illegal settlement ha happens in the city, this uh, places won't get electricity. So all this illegal appropriating power energy comes to be under. So I think it's it's not like I, I, I think it's also a problem of uh, society organization and all those things that we see are in the Thank you. Um, at the back, did you have a point or not? Okay. Yes, I thought I saw you. <laughs> On that point in South Africa, and I have seen this in quite a few other African cities, someone gets planning permission to build a house, and they build all they want this house. Then they have an extension where either a relative or the subtenants live. So even in places where they're properly mapped, these extensions can house families, and they have an illegal connection that's usually quite discreet. So that also places a huge load on, on the system. However, there's, you need to think critically also beyond just government and people. In many, many countries, the government does not have the money, including developed countries, does not have the money to generate, transmit, and distribute energy. There are private companies that do the generation usually. Transmission is usually the national government for national security reasons. But who do you think ultimately pays? So all these illegal connections, what usually happens, the government is billed by the generating company or by a utility company. So even if the government looks away when you're putting the illegal connection, they'll get this money back in taxes from society. So it's in everybody's best interest to have a functional electricity system because 
there is what is called an offtake agreement. If a private company comes into your country or into your district and builds something with its own capital, usually they sign at least a 20-year offtake agreement where the local government or the national government agrees to buy electricity at a certain price for th th that number of years. So whatever is sold is paid for and if is, that money cannot be recouped from the population, the government has to pay anyway. But where does government get, get its money from? Taxes. So all these things are interrelated. You can find the price of food and transport and products is higher and higher, or VAT, or pay as you earn. But all these things are sort of interrelated. Yes, please. That, like in cases where there are like large industries and factories, people tend to save more because they'll get like things like power, coal system to dominant purpose. But at the same time, there was this uh, case and one case in at least where it was like people were facing issues like waste from the uh, industries, but still they, they were choosing the case because they were going to uh, constant uh, energy again. So even like a companies play a big role in this, and the places where there are like big industries and factories are also uh, play a big role. Thank you. We'll do a little exercise, and we'll involve people on this side of the room first. So after that, I'm sorry I've forgotten your name. Ash. 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 Ashmeet. Name any three countries in the world. Three countries. Okay, we'll pick um, Canada. Look at what their GDP is. Uh, name any country in Africa. And please remind me your name. Ashmeet, I'll try to remember Ashmeet. Kushna. Sorry? Kushna. Okay. In Africa, yes. Okay, I'll give you Sudan. Sudan. Okay, I, do, do both of you have an internet connection? Okay, good. Your name, I've forgotten, sorry. Shalini. Shalini. Yeah. So Shalini, name a country in Latin America. You're very bad with geography. Okay, name any country in the world. <laughs> Apart from India and US, the US and the US. Any country? Albania. Albania. Good. So, Albania. Please just Google what their GDP is. And then we will tell the class. And then the back row, the people who haven't spoken, I think, um, Sergei, um, pick a country that has not been mentioned by these two. Okay, name another country that's not in Europe. USA. Brazil. Okay, Brazil. Look at Brazil's GDP. You're Anastasia, right? Okay, you, which country? South Korea. Another country? In any country. I mean, there is like... <laughs> okay, beautiful. Look at the GDP of North Korea and then tell us what the number is. So whoever finds the one first in the people I've mentioned, just say. Ashmi. One? That is per capita. GDP, I think you're talking about. So there's GDP, and then there's per capita is per person, what they make, you know, per, and usually per, per year. So just GDP of the country. It's a big number, it's not a small number. Yes. 
Anyone else actually looks for it? Yeah, the GDP of Albania is 42 billion. So, uh, Albania, 42 billion. Anyone else uh, amongst the people of the sun? Us. Yes, please. Uh, Sudan, 42. Sudan is 42. Sudan and Albania are surprisingly close. Anastasia? 28.5 billion. North Korea. Uh, were you watching uh, Korean films this weekend? <laughs> um, Sergei? Um, So that's one point six trillion or thereabout, yeah. You said one thousand six hundred billion, right? So that's six trillion, yes. Uh, one person hasn't said anything. And who's left? And which country is this? Canada. So Canada is one point. So that's one point nine trillion. Okay. So now. In your spare time, look at your countries during the break and, and see. ExxonMobil, as of 2018, the company had 285 billion. That already is five to six times the GDP of Sudan and, and Albania and 10 times that of North Korea. Finland's GDP, Finland, which is um, a European country, is less. It's about it was to 276 billion in 2018. Shell's revenue was 380 million US. That's X number of times. And if you pick African countries, it's, it's laughable. And if you pick smaller states, it's even funnier. Glencore, uh, Glencore is a mining company, 221 billion. Portugal's GDP, Portugal is in the EU, is about 238 billion. Qatar's GDP is 188 billion and one of the richest countries in the world, most of which is attributed to oil. And I haven't mentioned, if you check the largest oil and gas companies, you'll be surprised to see a few names there. Like Sinoc is huge. I think it's one of the largest um, companies. In fact, this is... I'll ask you to look at the largest companies, oil and gas and mining companies, and look at their annual turnovers. What I'm trying to say here is companies do have more power than many countries when it comes to financial might or economics. And when we talk about lobbying, lobbying is using money to get an intended policy outcome. Are we together? Are we ha have we made the connection? Because I'm just seeing people nodding. So, why, what does this have to do with climate change? That paper, which I urge you to read, is a 2017 scientific paper, said that 63% of global carbon emissions are traceable to 90 companies. So when we think about countries, and we said, you know, China, um, India are the largest emitters. If 90 companies invested sustainably, we have the potential of dealing with about 63% of global carbon emissions. So this is not just a question of 
countries. It's a question of dealing with some of these um, companies. And you'll see why this is important. They're all interlinked because um, this is a picture that will be useful in the next class as well. Who do you empower? Because it's not just about an energy system consists of different actors. Here, these people come very close to where my mom was born. And this is a beautiful story, actually. The women in this, in this area are the ones who do everything. Everything. And they live in what are called manyatas. And because the area is quite dry and hot, Manyatas are windowless, so they are dark day and night. And the source of light usually is the source of heat. So the fire is both the source of heat and light in there. But the fire is not um, piped gas, as you would imagine. So it's either firewood, usually firewood, and when firewood is not there, some communities use dried cow dung. So you can imagine the kind of smoke that's in there. Of course, of course, don't, don't need to ask. So what did the women in this place do? They formed um, a society and they imported, they started importing solar panels and installing them for a fee. And they used that money to develop um, other things. They built better houses, they paid fees for their kids, they dealt with healthcare, and they got health professionals to help them with um, childbirth. And it also allowed the girls to study because there was a light bulb in this dark manata. So when you think of energy systems, there are a lot of players. It's not just government. It's not just large corporations. You're dealing with everyday issues that everyday people face. And during the trip, if there's anything to go by, I can bet that the same challenges are faced in places like India. I spoke with people from Russia, and I can bet, like in Siberia, for example, where the temperatures get to minus 40, questions of affordability, questions of a consistent supply of energy are real. Questions of transportation. What food do you get? If suddenly um, we are seeing some energy infrastructure is destroyed, it would be very, very difficult for people to survive for a week at minus 40, minus 50 temperatures. Unless I'm mistaken, you know, you're looking at me like I'm saying things that are not true. People do not uh, do not look at them and that because they are used to solve them easily. And, uh, this is why it, it, they, they do not prioritize it in the way you think. So this is not the top priority. This, this, is, this is a very good answer. Because even in this community, installing solar was not. This is a privately sourced solution. They just thought, look, we need light. What do we do? But if you're looking at societies and governments that are responsible, and that are responsible to provide these things because in the same country there are people with you know the same country very close to here in fact i will show you at some stage a school that's located on the way to this place and it's unbelievable it is absolutely unbelievable i've been to american schools that are nothing close so if you have these two people coexisting should, is it fair and just that a girl born here has this type of access that is self-generated? The same way, you know, when you say people don't prioritize, it's true. Uh, the government hasn't taken the national grid to this community as, as we speak. But is, is it correct? Is it right? Because it's like survival. Flood-prone areas, people dig trenches, they move, they come back. Humans sort of evolve, but if we're looking at a systemic challenge, 
should we look for individualized solutions to systemic challenges? I think not. Um, we have five minutes. I'll release you early so that you take a bit of a break. You look, you look hammered. I think, um, please, whatever you do at the break, get go and come back with some energy. And we will do a few exercises. But here is a question for your homework with every class. Which companies would you target first if you were to be the Prime Minister of India or if you were to be the representative of Assam in 2027? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so which companies would you prioritize? But also, in the break, just Google your sort of the GDPs of different countries and see how that stacks up against the top 10 oil companies and their annual turnover. It, it's, it's incredible. I've released you early. We convene at 12. It says you converge back at 12? 20. Um, okay, 12, 12, 25. Be back here at 12, 25. Yes, yeah, so we have this learning scheme here. Um, is there one trillion dollar company? Ah, they claim Tesla. Tesla has claimed. Um, if you look at Apple, there's a really interesting infographic. Have you seen those things where over the years it goes like, yeah, so if you search like the most valuable companies, Many of them are tech companies, which also uh, some people sort of question because like Tesla's value is not in its car stock. It's in, in its stock in the stock exchange, which is virtual. I mean, if an event can happen and tomorrow it plummets. So some people question about the real value of these companies. But a very interesting thing, I wish there was a Chinese person in the class because quite a number of those high value companies are in China. Le yeah, like Tencent, Alibaba has dipped a, a bit since they abducted. Um, <laughs> so just have a look at the most valuable companies. And there are other questions which we are going to ask because does the location of a company matter? Does it not? But now, we are going to look at stakeholders. So uh, the last picture I showed you, you know, I, we talked first about these global companies and a very local company of, of women doing work. So who matters in energy systems? Or rather, who should matter in energy systems? And I'll break it down in groups so that this class is slightly more interactive. I'm not sure how many you are. Um, and maybe you should be from different places so that you sort of interact more, but we'll, let's see. Let's go through a couple of slides and then we'll break into groups. So, stakeholders. I've listed some, some of the stakeholders in energy systems for you to just start thinking about when you go into your discussion groups, because there's a question of who, who matters and who should matter. And if you, if you notice in every class, there's some reading material, which I suspect uh, you haven't uh, fully interacted with. But after I'm gone, please just have a look. Because some of them will explain in far more detail and help you understand how these things sort of interact. But let's start with communities um, and the energy quadrilemma. Namibia is just an example. I've used the same example consistently so that we, we, we follow the argument. But you could substitute Namibia for India, Russia, any country. So when you talk about rural renewables, you cannot implement, and Anubhav, I think you talked about implementation, you cannot implement projects in the same way in different societies. An example is rural renewables in Namibia cannot work the same way that they work in rural Tanzania or Rwanda or Pakistan, or Bangladesh, for a variety of reasons. One, we have what renewable energy is available. 
there are certain parts where solar is available. And let's even pick solar, which is sort of available in all the countries I've mentioned. Namibians also have one cultural challenge, which is, apart from the fact that it's a large country that's sparsely populated with very few people, they don't like huddling together. It's actually the first African society that I've been in where they actually prefer their space. Many African societies are organized in villages. In fact, many would live in one area and have a communal farm, like outside. Namibians actually love their space. They love their space so much that even in apartment buildings, well, they probably love their meat more than they love their space. In, even in apartment buildings, they have an outdoor sort of oven or barbecue uh, place. They call them braais in Southern Africa, in, in the Balkans. They love their roast meat, um, and normally roasting meat in many other parts of at least um, West, East, Central Africa is a communal thing. You know, you invite people to your back garden and you roast meat together. There in apartment buildings, everyone has their own sort of, like a, a traditional Italian um, furnace in apartment buildings. So that also means that apart from the fact that it's a large country with few people, Few, these few people land in small concentrations. If you've ever taken a flight in any large country, you can see that humans are pack animals. Like immediately you fly out, there's a high concentration of houses and people, and then maybe 10 minutes in your flight, just land. So people love to hang around other people. Namibia is slightly different in that sense. So if you were to have rural renewables, even in a village, your wiring system would not be terminating in, a, in, in one place. It would need to, to disperse quite far. So that presents a huge challenge because it's easier to distribute electricity to people who are in one location. That's why most cities in the world have electricity because you know the energy demand, you can put up the infrastructure, but immediately you start having dispersion of people, it means there's an extra cost. And with every, with distance, you lose the power that you generate if you are not aware. So if you are generating, say, one gigawatt, and you are transmitting electricity from the north to the south of India, by the time you step down that electricity and it gets to homes, it will not be one gigawatt. There are transmission losses. So even for community energy, community energy implementation strategies in Namibia would need to be different from community implementation strategies in South Africa, where they, most people, despite having bigger land than Namibia, they live in townships. This is a problem of apartheid, but we'll talk about that maybe in the second last class. But it's easier to then have community solar in South Africa because people are in large settlements than it is in Namibia. So when you think of communities, don't just think of stakeholders and what they contribute to the, to the system, but what role they play is really important. International financial institutions. As of 2020, most of the large international banks, the World Bank, EBRD, the Asian Development Bank, they do not fund coal-powered uh, projects. In fact, many of them do not even fund oil and gas, although they came under criticism because they now want to fund gas um, after the war in, in Ukraine. I think sometimes people are using the war in Ukraine, one, as an excuse, but also it's exposed global geopolitics, but has also exposed just how closely interrelated we are. An example is that a, a lot of the wheat that is consumed in Africa, which really should have more than enough wheat, comes from Ukraine. A lot of the fertilizer, I know a few African governments that have had to go to Morocco or other places to get fertilizer from the time the war started. So international financial institutions, and why is this significant? Why do you think the World Bank or the European Bank of Reconstruction and Development or the IFC not funding fossil fuel infrastructure is important for the energy transition. 
I will wait in uncomfortable silence for about 10 seconds, then I'll pick someone in the third row. Um, in the third row. And you're smiling, so it'll probably be you. <laughs> Anyone get, wants to guess why it's important? Yeah. How much do you think it costs to set up um, even a coal-fired power plant for one gigawatt? Yeah, basically that is the right answer. <laughs> yeah, that, that is the right answer. It costs a lot of money and many governments do not have a lot of surplus money. So how are these projects funded? These projects are funded by international banks. International banks. So if you look at large energy projects, pick any. I mean, check the Ethiopian one and maybe tell us um, in the course of the class who has funded it. And you'll see it's a, it's, it's a large multinational uh, corporation, um, bank. So if they don't fund fossil fuel infrastructure, that means that alternative sources of funding need to be found. And very few other alternatives are available if that type of fuel will not give them the return that they're looking for. So finance is an aspect we're going to look at and how important it is. We've already seen money is used for lobbying. Money is used by smaller communities to improve their livelihoods using energy. But on a grander scale, on an international scale, this is a big deal. But here comes the question. Refusing to fund fossil fuels is not equivalent to deliberately funding renewable energy projects. So there comes another question. Culture and, culture and exclusion are explained to you about South African townships and solar, but US neighborhood pastors was something that surprised me to no end. So I had a short stint in, in Michigan, and Detroit is one of the most deprived and dangerous places in the US. And so after the 2008 financial crash, there are streets upon streets where houses where people are taken mortgages were foreclosed, or basically the people were evicted and the houses taken back. And these communities, some of them live in abject poverty. I mean, it's, it's extraordinary. So what happens, there's a program similar to what Anubhav you mentioned. And this project is run by government. And it's about providing energy to the poorest people, especially in the winter. And Michigan is very close to Canada, and therefore the winters are bitterly, bitterly cold. But for government to be able to assess, there was a specific project which my supervisor in Michigan was involved with, which was analyzing light bulbs. So change, changing incandescent light, light bulbs to LED light bulbs has huge energy efficiency uh, measures. It costs less, you replace them fewer times. So the government rolled out this project. And, but what did the government do? The government rolled out this project in larger supermarkets because it is easier. So you'd replace your normal incandescent light bulb. Um, this is the light bulb that has that little spring which blows from time to time. Normal light bulbs, not the LED ones. Do you know the difference between, am I? This one, uh, this one is an incandescent one, but not the leaf. <laughs> now, the LED ones, I'm sure you know what an LED light um, is like. So the technology, of, of course, of LED bulbs is that they use far less electricity and they last much longer. The project was rolled out to help, especially the energy poor, to save money. But which is the largest supermarket in Karnataka? Okay, in India. Or name a large supermarket, any. Big Bazaar, D-Mart, Reliance. Do, do you find a lot of pe poor people in those supermarkets? You don't. So a program that was designed to help poor people change their light bulbs where do poor people go to shop? Local shops or corner shops as they call them in the, in the UK or kiosk in other parts of the world. Those, that program was not rolled out there. 
So the people who benefited from this program, one, the middle class who went and replaced all their light bulbs and the people for whom it was intended did not work. But then the government attempted to help these poor neighborhoods by sending energy auditors to go and see who was this light bulb so that they replace them. But if someone heard an audit, they thought, look, they want to come tax me more. They want to find out whether I'm an illegal immigrant or not. So they absolutely flatly rejected it. And in some of the neighborhoods where this worked, they used the pastors in the neighborhoods, because that's where a lot of these people would go to church, to sort of roll out this pro program. So start thinking in your community, who has a voice, like in Assam? There's someone in class who seems to have a voice. Who are the people, if you're rolling out your campaign in 2027, who will you talk to who has an influence in community? And the same way, if you're going to use those people to, to sort of fund and disseminate your campaign, you can then use the same networks to implement energy policy. Academia, you have a question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. So basically, for these sort of bulbs, yes. we need to just pay ten rupees yes. for the bulb. And for an energy bulb, one can then have to pay more than one fifty. So people usually prefer to have this one. So they think that even if it just uh, ten rupees. So. This is a really important point. In the US, it was subsidized. The government was paying the difference between an LED bulb and an incandescent bulb. And it's the people who had money who got it. And, they, and then when the government really tried to get to people's homes, the language that was used, and you're a liberal arts college, so the language of communication is really important. When they called it an audit, everyone thought, you know, the government is coming to see whether we are doing anything illegal, which normally you would find. Or, and so even the language of communication can have an impact on whether your policy works. I'll put you in groups shortly, so don't worry can see your energy levels keep rising and falling. Academia. A lot of academics seem to have their heads up in the clouds. We talk about climate change as an existential threat. Um, we talk about transitioning from things. And many people, do one, do not take academics seriously. And two, many people do not read academic texts. If students are anything to judge um, <laughs> how much people read academic texts, and they need it for their exams and they don't, how much more do people outside of universities read these things? So there's several questions. One, how academic research is communicated is really important. What type of academic research is done? Because if we are doing research on something that has no real application to people, then they will not find use for our academic expertise. But I went to a, to, um, a center in Texas called TEPRI, and I'd urge you to just Google it. They used academic research to find energy interventions in communities. And this makes sense. The business of the academy is to research and teach. So for a researcher, they're very happy to look at, say, the impact of changing a light bulb from an incandescent one to an LED one on the energy system. That's something you know a researcher in a university would be very happy. That is not a thing a government official is going to spend the time doing the math and writing research papers. But there's a lot of research papers that are lying untouched. So TEPRI and the University of Michigan and the University of Texas, TEPRI consists of a blend of both the government um, in Texas um, private entities and the utility in Texas and the university. The university so gets the data from the utilities and government and then uses that data to generate certain scenarios. So it worked really well. And the success story of this is that the things I'm talking about are actually quite practical. The research paper that was done was done by my supervisor then, Tony Reams. Tony Reams showed that poorer neighborhoods are more disadvantaged because they don't get these bulbs and the government project is failing. And right now, Tony Reams is the deputy director at the Department of Energy working with Joe Biden. So 
there is academia can engage with the public. Now, lobbyists, I never ever fathomed that lobbying can be a profession until I went to DC. Like, almost every third person you bump into is lobbying for something. And they lobby judges, they lobby legislators. And so, all these places you go, there are lobbyists, even in I, what surprised me the most, the person who was heading TEPRI used to be a lawyer in New York, and she said she lost a case once because they were, not because her case was poor, but her opponent had lobbyists who knew the judges, researchers, and the judge, and what the judge likes to hear, and they used that in their depositions and won. And so she became a lobbyist. <laughs> she left the law firm and became a lobbyist. And she's, um, she's brilliant. So lobbying is not always so, such an art in other countries. So this, to me, came as a surprise because there are people whose work, when they wake up in the morning, is to lobby for a thing or the other. Um, I cannot speak about it, but I'm currently talking to someone who a group that worked with the US government, and it's incredible just how much global reach they have. They have their tentacles in every continent, and it's, it's, it's just insane. Anyway, so based, this research says that 322 million was paid to the Senate to determine energy policy in 2018. Money directly flowing that has been recorded by the national um, statistics. And of course we know that that's less than what actually was paid. And this is the official money that was used and declared by, by companies. And these came from the Federal Election Commission statistics. So who can guess whether lobbying increases before or after elections? Do you think, what do you think? Yes, so before elections, they lobby to determine what the next government's policy on energy is going to be. But how does this stack up between different energy resources? So, oil firms. BP spent 53 million in the US Senate um, Shell spent 49 million, ExxonMobil spent 41 million, Chevron spent 29 million, and Total spent 29 million. In, not in the one year, to the Senate only. We haven't talked about the House of Representatives. We've not talked about how much money they gave the various parties. When This is in one year, and that is 2019. And this was specifically on climate lobbying, not just on other aspects, like this was specifically to climate lobby. But how does this stack up to renewable energy? Okay, so if you look at the years, it tells you what was happening before and after. So the amounts keep rising and they fell somewhere around 2016, but they keep rising. You can see it's always a curve like that before an election. And I will not be shocked um, that in post-2021, you'll find that gas lobbying will be sky high because the intention now is to claim that gas is a cleaner source of energy than oil and coal, and they want it to be a transitional fuel for the next X number of years. And we'll see this because the next COP conference is going to be at, in, in the United Arab Emirates, and they started laying ground for this in Egypt. So we'll see a lot of money going into energy and natural resources lobbying in the coming years. Now, how do these compare? 26 million in renewables, 360 million for oil and gas. Who do you think will get what they want? So 13 to 1. So group work. 
I would like there's 17 of you I'd like you to mix a little so how do we do this so three each those three those three those three then the four of you will be in a group and then so one two three four one two three one two three one two three and then each one of you join a group on this side yeah this way you've you've got what i'm saying so the three of you the three of you the three of, ramia you're here with the assam member of parliament <laughs> <laughs> sorry yes and sergey and then each one of you join one group amongst those pick pick your own not the same group just join one of those three groups um, now sometime now would be very nice so pick a country so that's the first assignment please join the groups and then I can come around and give you you can move whichever way you want the three of you just huddle together please You can sit in the same row, it's up to you. No, no, they'll not, they're not working on Japan, they'll change. In your country. And then in, amongst those actors, or even apart from those actors, who do you think needs to be empowered for the energy transition? And then do you think local initiatives matter? And which ones do you think can be put there? I'll give you an example, say in rural Kenya, you need rooftop solar. In, um, say, rural Scotland, you probably need heating to tran transition to more sustainable heating. So Scotland is heat pumps that they need the most. So just something like that. So. If you have any group one is working on Japan. So group one, someone come up. Or the whole group can come to the front and present the way you like. It's up to you. You can choose one person or all of you can come. Do you have to be at the center the podium? Yeah. So we selected Japan and in terms of its energy mix, 40% uh, is accounted for fossil fuels, which include coal, oil and natural gas. Then about 5% for nuclear energy, about 3% for hydroelectric power, 10% uh, for renewable energy, mainly uh, solar and wind, and um, less than 1% for geothermal and biomass. In terms of which actors are powerful in uh, Japan, we, in Japan we could find that uh, government agencies, that government agencies, industry groups, uh, ruling party members, uh, which was Liberal Democratic Party, and energy specialists, which we believe are just members of the civil society, they comprised major actors uh, when it came to Japan's energy policy. And uh, I think one of the bigger challenges in Japan was its dependence on oil. Um, around 70% of uh, Japan's oil uh, actually comes from its imports, mainly from the Middle East. So uh, with that in mind, I think energy security becomes a major concern because it actually depends mostly on other countries to uh, I mean for its sustenance on uh, 
oil which is a second point who would you empower uh, I'll, I'll just uh, also mention that the top corporations uh, include the electric uh, power development company which uh, uh, mainly focuses on hydro electric and thermal power and the second largest uh, is the Japan Atomic Power Company which is also uh, in uh, regards to nuclear power generation and uh, like Japan has been moving towards a more sustainable energy mix in recent years following the uh, Fukushima, Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster in 2011 and the country has been increasing its use of uh, renewable energy sources and reducing its dependence on fossil fuels and uh, at, uh, Japan has ambitious plans to increase the share of renewable energy to 22 to 24 percent by 2030. Who would be like to answer? Can I just say say? So in Japan, it is, it is important to empower both the government and private sector to work together in order to effectively address energy issues. The government can provide funding and support for research and development of renewable uh, energy technologies as well as implement policies to encourage their use. The private sector can invest in and implement these technologies, driving innovation and comp uh, competition to make them more cost effective. Additionally, empowering communities and individuals to take ownership of their energy usage and consider sustainable options can also play a crucial role. And one thing that I also uh, researched and found out that Japan is third in terms of utilizing geothermal energy and that area can be further expanded upon uh, because it is already the third largest but uh, uh, still in terms of the energy mix for Japan it still uh, ranks the lowest. Uh, also in terms of I think the third yeah the third and the, the second question um, I think they kind of intersect with each other because when we found out about uh, local initiatives in Japan uh, we found that there are quite a few cities, especially Miyama, Totori and one more, uh, which have successfully established their own energy companies in partnerships with uh, private power retailers. And uh, these projects have, have shown significant results. So I think such local initiatives, of course, matter. And these could further be empowered in terms of uh, looking at, you know, wider or nationalistic uh, projects. So joint ventures, joint investments, um, public-private partnerships. I think these are something which could be encouraged. And this is, uh, and this is also possible because uh, Japan as a country is decentralized uh, and municipalities have some autonomy in terms of energy policies. So in Japan, uh, the Ministry of Economy, Trade and Industry is the main authority that oversees the energy policies. But local government and municipalities have the autonomy to implement their own policies and their initiatives can have an impact on the energy landscape of the country. Thank you very much. Any questions for Anastasia and <laughs> There being no questions, I'll invite group two. Um, but hold up for the center representative. <laughs> so our uh, good afternoon so our country is uh, turkey uh, turkey is one of the second largest uh, electricity market in europe uh, so when it comes to resources and energy mix of turkey so coal uh, accounts to 35% and natural gas to 22% hydropower to 20% and wind 10% and solar is 4.7% and uh, geothermal is 3.3% yeah uh, so let's try to answer the first question. Uh, main actors in the market of uh, in the country uh, in Turkey, uh, especially in these uh, climate aspects, uh, are government, Turkish government for sure, uh, and uh, international 
international energy companies that have the, uh, their rep representatives in uh, Turkey that has that have deals and uh, affairs in Turkey. Uh, when we mentioned uh, government as a main st st uh, stakeholder in uh, Turkey, is because uh, the existing uh, regime of uh, Recep Erdogan is uh, might be considered as a dictatorship. Uh, which suppresses uh, democracy in general in Turkey. This is why we cannot say that um, green energy movements and initiatives might be uh, supported and pushed from the side of citizens and some other uh, NGOs uh, in Turkey. This is why uh, government still plays and uh, probably will play the main role uh, in this aspect. So, uh, Hema, would you like to add something? Uh, yeah, so one of the things that's most important is like how uh, Turkey should have more of climate activism as of now, because now according to the, I actually got some stats. So according to the 2021 report of the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, uh, Turkey will experience three accelerating trends. So rising temperatures, dehydration, and rising sea levels. And the country is likely to experience more frequent and more severe weather conditions throughout the year. And by 2050, temperatures are predicted to increase by 2.5 Celsius in the east and central Turkey, and by 1.5 Celsius on the coast, uh, uh, coasts. And the temperature in exceeding 40 degrees Celsius are expected in summers for extended periods. So now, just give me a moment. Because uh, as Pavel uh, uh, said that, you know, like we have increasingly uh, now it is under Erdogan's power and that, uh, you know, the uh, like, you know, climate activism has experienced a lot of attacks, you know, a lot of repression. So the climate is actually something that is not really considered that important as of now. But... Uh, but climate uh, is activism is also very important in order to save its democracy. I've actually uh, got a source. It's called Carnegie Europe. And uh, why? Because it will actually, uh, like, you know, help all the local communities might come together. And, uh, you know, they will come together to protect the livelihoods. And, uh, yeah, and also, like, a part where they would resist against the local, uh, against the tyranny of the government and so on. Uh, considering the fact, um, uh, the relevant situation, the actual situation of energy mix of uh, Turkey, uh, the one uh, Anubav mentioned, we should also th say that uh, Turkey is a country um, it was a very interesting and a convenient uh, lo uh, localization. has a lot of potential in developing of its uh, renewable resources, including solar, uh, solar energy, uh, hydropower, and so on. However, the, mo uh, the actual situation in this region, um, we mean Europe, uh, Ukraine, Black Sea, in Mediterranean regions, um, Turkey has no... Uh, has no motivation to develop these sources of energy and this is why Erdogan's initiatives and uh, international um, companies initiatives to develop local uh, gas um, gas uh, sources yes uh, yes so so the local context uh, is that um, International situation, uh, the war in Europe, uh, the war in Ukraine uh, pushes Turkey to develop its local uh, gas hubs and uh, gas production, uh, gas extraction. I mean, and uh, this is why uh, the existing uh, existing uh, stakeholders do not uh, move uh, move on, move on in the direction of energy. Uh, Green energy. So we think that uh, the most, uh, the most uh, pers uh, interesting and potential way to uh, 
uh, solve this problem is to empower uh, pro-Western uh, parties in government and maybe more local energy companies uh, because the general general trend in, in the West is to decrease oil and gas production and to increase uh, green energy production, I mean among governments, not among uh, international companies. So I think that uh, this way is uh, rather interesting to develop dem democratic institutions in Turkey in general uh, is also a way to solve this problem, to mitigate it at least. But to your question now, so uh, yes, recently uh, Turkey explored new sor uh, source, uh, sources for gas extraction, extraction in Black Sea area that uh, they control. So uh, they potentially uh, might be uh, become more self-independent. Uh, self -dependent. Uh, however, they don't have this need because uh, the whole Europe now might be dependent on uh, Turkish uh, gas trading. Uh, affairs, so they don't have to produce gas themselves, but the fact that uh, Turkey is becoming a very important gas hub in um, Europe makes it very influential uh, in this en energy area. Uh, Australia consumed about 1600 terawatt hours of energy in year 2021. The energy mix goes like 26% natural gas, 33% petroleum, 30% coal, just 2% hydropower and 8% non-hydropower renewable that is solar and wind. And the average energy consumption per person is 60,000 kilowatt hour. It used to be above 70,000 kilowatt hours, but uh, it's been on a gradual and slow decline. And the Australian government long-term emission reduction plan is to achieve net zero emission by year 2050. So the actors powerful in Australia are A, the government agency, so there is AEMC, Australian Energy Market Commission. It is the national economic regulatory and the body responsible for uh, enforcing the energy law. Then there is energy institution. So there are big three energy retailer in Australia. First is Origin Energy, then there is AGL, and then Energy Australia. Then there are state regulators, representative groups, consumer organizations. Uh, the second question is who would you empower so it's the answer is actually related to the first question uh, we would empower the actors which are playing a powerful role in uh, like emission because Australia is trying to move to uh, renewable energy and we would empower Australian energy regulators and more state regulator because uh, I think according to 2022 report the state uh, had 1.4 billion budget for renewable energy and energy institutions like Origin and in, uh, Energy Australia would be the actors that we would be empowering including the community and for the third question yeah of course uh, uh, of, Sorry, 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 I forgot something. So also there are companies like Horan and Bird who are trying to build uh, companies with solar power and impacting uh, the renewable energy source in the country. So we would be empowering companies like Horan and Bird who are involved in the development of renewable energy. And of, uh, for the third question, yes, local communities matter uh, because Australia is trying to do uh, a lot of community-owned renewable energy to improve the, the environment, also creating an opportunity for the community to benefit in the uh, local uh, renewable energy sources. So uh, we would empower the locals because it matters in the economic strength uh, and educating people in the country to create a sustainable, low-carbon future, and also uh, reducing communities' carbon footprint and using developing energy industries like technology and creating jobs and uh, trainings. And uh, the energy trilemma that we talked in class plays a great role in this because in empowering the community, uh, we need policy makers, which is the politics, also environment and playing a great role in the sustainable development. And then in economy, uh, creating job opportunities which are uh, 
which which will play a great role in having uh, the renewable energy in Australia. So yeah. So we took this um, country, Bangladesh. So first of all, I think it's important to look at the geography of this country before looking at the energy sources and the stakeholders and all these questions. So Bangladesh is a country that is located in the heart of the Ganges Brahmaputra Delta in the south of the Asian continent um, that um, borders India and Myanmar. And um, so uh, in, in, in terms of the stakeholders, the local community stakeholders that I'm going to um, talk about is fishers and the textile industry where the jute farming is one of the most important source of um, income uh, in the local community and also the fisher community and uh, they have tobacco farming and as well as uh, they have shipping as one of the important financial source for the um, country's GDP. So the rest, the, the big companies that are there in Bangladesh, uh, Ashmit will talk about that. And about the energy mix of Bangladesh, uh, they rely more on coal, gas and renewable energy. Um, so basically renewable energy consists of only 3.69 percentage that are solar, wind and um, solar and wind and uh, coal energy um, consists of 6.86 percent and gas consists of 44.53 percent. Uh, now over to Ashmeet. So Bangladesh uh, whole GDP is 460.75 billion and uh, the biggest companies there are uh, first is Gramophone which is the leading power of telecommunication service in Bangladesh which uh, whose GDP is uh, 454.91 billion and the uh, and uh, the second company is uh, Walton Bangladesh. It's a multinational electrical and electronics and uh, automobiles company. Its GDP is uh, 363.91 billion. So these are uh, the few bigger companies there. So basically I'm going to take a talk about the politics and who you empower. That the points I'll cover. The Bangladesh is the eighth most pop populated country in the world. It has a population of 16 crore and uh, 88 lakhs to 27,626. And uh, it is ruled by uh, the president is Abdul Hamid and the prime minister, Sheikh Hasina. They belong to the party of Bangladesh Awami League. That is a nationalist party, center left. And the second highest party is uh, Jatia party, who is led by ZM Quaden and uh, there are some communist party as well the, the parties are workers party of Bangladesh etc. The major ethnic group in Bangladesh is Bengali it is over 90 percent and uh, as already mentioned by Remia the public sectors that are jute and shipping company etc. So we have to uh, we talk togetherly that uh, we thought who would you empower, we thought, we thought about that and we are coming to a point like uh, the first empowerment uh, we want to do is the for the fishermen, that the majority of the persons are fishermen so uh, we have to empower the fishermen as well we have to change the pattern of their ships so the ships are using highest number of petroleum and other resources so we have to make it uh, uh, we, we have to uh, so make it efficient with solar and the, uh, more interestingly 67 percent of the population of Bangladesh are of 15 to 65 years of age so they have a huge number of uh, working personalities there okay so uh, that and we have to empower the as we see, the woman empowerment is a huge sector in whole whole uh, world politics. So we can see the jute uh, related to jute. We have the best teaching uh, teaching women in 
Bangladesh. So if we empower the teaching sector in Bangladesh, that will be a great uh, for the people of Bangladesh. As Asmit mentioned, the larger groups, uh, uh, larger companies of Bangladesh are Gramophone and Walton. They both are IT and telecommunication related and electronic appliances related companies. If we want to empower the youth of Bangladesh, we have to empower them with skills that are uh, IT and electronics related. So here I end up my thinking and I'm giving it to Sorry. Thank you. Also, uh, we want to talk about the cons um, of living in Bangladesh. Sorry, uh, minus is uh, this uh, overpopulation, uh, anti-sanitary conditions, uh, pandemics, lack of water and uh, hunger, uh, floods and rains, low standards of living, and uh, criminal environment. Uh, so for the last question, do local context and initiatives matter? So um, as our uh, group, um, we all came to this consensus that yes, they do matter. And here we comes with some of these um, solutions like um, using more renewable energy in the areas of um, fishing and also the fashion industry that is um, there in Bangladesh. And also, um, which is uh, the same with the shipping and the merchant navy that is very important in this um, country. Thank you so much. Because we have roughly 10 minutes. And then there's a question I'll ask in the coming slides, which we'll handle maybe in the class tomorrow. So just a few comments from what you've presented. I'm glad that you've incorporated some of the things we've learned about, like the energy mix, identifying who the key actors are. But there are certain things, um, whenever you're presenting, have also some form of critical outlooks. For example, the first group, um, the first group looked at renewables. Um, there were certain questions that I thought would, would come up um, for a country like Japan. And one of the things you asked during the break, what is their transport system looking like? Japan is a large car manufacturer. And one of the policies in Europe right now is that by 2030, cars, every car coming out of a production line, at least in the UK that hits the roads, will have to be at least hybrid or electrical. If Japan did that, and they have some of the largest car manufacturers, it would have a knock-on effect. So these are some of the things when I was asking, you know, which actors are powerful, who would you empower? The, for group two, there were certain things you mentioned there, uh, but there's something that struck me. You know, you said that when you look at trends in the West, and that is a really controversial thing you've said there because uh, Turkey has attempted to join the EU for quite a while now. They're not necessarily considered the West. They occupy an exceptionally um, strategic position. So they're always having this balance between the Middle East, Asia, and Europe. And so some of the geopolitics there, it would be good to hear some of that when you're analyzing. But well done to all the groups. Uh, and when we talk about group three, um, I liked how the presentation was made, you know, jobs, politics, climate, but there was one thing that you emphasized on, which is empowering the powerful. As you'll see in energy justice, those who are already overrepresented do not need further representation. So some of the groups that are most impacted are the ones that need a seat at the table because the more powerful actors have the tools to be represented themselves. Finally, on Bangladesh, there was, uh, I liked the fact that you, f you had a focus on I the industries, like fishing and fashion, they, they rhyme, so easy to remember. <laughs> but also, you looked at some of the contextual problems. You know, they have a water problem. But what I did not see was how then you related that to the interventions and the groups that you'd empower. But very well done to everybody. I think you all deserve a round of applause. Um, it was also good to see Ashmeet speak, you know, for the, <laughs> so that was, so that was very good. So, who do you know who this, hu does anyone know who this human is? 
and and in and who is he in the context of India? Yeah, so you see, richest, he's the richest person in India. <laughs> he's, he's supposedly the richest person in India, overtook the Ambani in, oh, in Asia now, yeah. So we, we've seen, so on one hand, we're talking about if you had the power, what would you do? But on the other hand, if you had the money, what would you invest in? I think we'll just pause there write that down somewhere and then when we have the discussion tomorrow or the day after de depending what would you invest in um sorry ah that i would not look at it as a uh, you know profit perspective but if i were a billionaire i'd want to make more money to do more good, or oh, that's what they claim. Sorry? Yeah, you need to have a philanthropist side to this answer, yes. But you also need to have, even if it's an investment that returns you, gives you profit, as Mekdes is saying, what would you invest in? Would you in invest in coal? Would you invest in renewables? And then the philanthropist side, what would you do? Because we've looked at interventions, you know, from a more national perspective. But imagine you had a lot of money, like a heck of a lot of money. And just Google this man's um, net worth and compare to some smaller countries. He probably would buy a few countries with the, with, with the money that, that he has. Correct. You just choose the country, a country of your choice. So, like, assume you as Mectus. Now, your picture was here, and people are arguing the richest or the <laughs> secondary. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, so wherever you'd want to invest, you as Mectus, put that there. A second question, and we have how many minutes have we got? Five. A second question for you to consider is. Do you matter right now? What can you do with your resources? And how do you matter? What can you do? So we'll discuss that tomorrow. Today, not in future, today, as, a, as, as you. No, no, as, as, as a, a thousand air, if, if, if at all. <laughs> if at all, today. Because... Many of us um, postpone life, and this is uh, more than just energy systems. You think that if you were richer, your life would be happier, you'd do more, yet you have quite a few resources within your grasp, not necessarily money. So what can you do now that will make a difference? So this is a real question, do you matter? We don't have the time to play the videos that I've, I have for you, but on a more practical scale, not everyone will be a billionaire. Billionaires are about 0.1% of the global population. So what can you do right now? So those are the two questions which we'll pick up tomorrow when we discuss our classes. I'll play this video for you tomorrow, really inspirational. Remember this slide always. Even when we talk about these things, I want to anchor you on certain fundamentals. When you think of the energy trilemma, it's a framework that helps you visualize these problems. When you think of the energy cycle, it's to help you to have a holistic view of energy systems, not just one part. Like, by the time there's a katia, there's everything from production. How is the government paying for that? How is it transmitting this energy? What are the problems of distribution? So the energy cycle is to make you think more holistically. But this also reminds you of the scale of the legal and policy challenge. So when you're making a proposal, just remember these places are disjoint, and there are different interests in energy systems. So you'll keep seeing these, these concepts to help you always frame your answers or your proposed policy interventions. The aims and principles, it's tiny, I told you, but the same thing. What are you aiming for and what principle are you anchoring your law in will then determine what law, the law will look like and what the policy intervention will look like. And so the conclusion for today, I'll probably, we should probably com compile this 
and discuss it in the last class, is we need to have similar aims on a global level. However, we need to come back to Earth. And building global frameworks is fine when we look at um, energy law and policy, but when you start looking at actors, it sort of grounds you. You need to see how these local contexts matter. But sometimes, even with a local context, you need the law to make some of these things happen. And um, enhance cooperation between states and non-state actors, but equally enhance responsibility, especially for non-state actors. Because it's not just governments that have a duty to, for sustainability and in energy systems. So that question I've already asked, that was my homework for you today, but I've asked it in different forms. So um, unless there are any further questions, thank you for enduring a double lesson, and thank you for your contributions to this class.